We live in a world that's full of a lot of things. It's a more troubled world than it, my growing up days and many of yours. And, and uh, God is at work in it. He has not uh, thrown it away or given up on our nation or any other place. He's at work and we're crying out to him and desiring to please him, looking for those opportunities every week when he opens a door and gives us a chance to touch somebody's life or to bring him to touch their lives, introducing him to them. So we're glad you're here and we want you to make yourself at home as we worship the Lord together. While you're seated, bow your heads with me and let us go to the Lord in prayer, beginning our service. Father, we want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here and for the joy of gathering together on a Sunday morning, this first day of a new week, and realize this is a day you've given us to worship. And we come together as the body of Christ, lift our voices and our desires to you and worship you. You've been good to us. And we're thankful for the sufficiency of your grace in the days past, this last week. And we anticipate your grace given in the week to come that will make possible our communication with others and our living for you in this world and being witnesses, salt and light in this world we live in. We're thankful that you're at work in it. We're thankful, Lord, that your faithfulness is evident in so many things. Many times we miss the little things, but the little things are being done all the time. And we're thankful for all of those. We're thankful that you're able to deliver us from infirmity or sickness, that you're able to bring life where there is death, that you're able to bring joy where there is nothing but a weightiness because of circumstance. So we ask you to have your way today and work in our lives and be glorified among us. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Stand with me as we begin this service singing, Let Us Worship the Lord. <clears throat> Our reading today is coming right out of the book of Hebrews once again. We're studying, working our way through this book. And the text today just precedes the reading, so I wanted to read them together. Three verses of text in, in the fourth chapter and then 10 verses continuing in chapter 5. Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 14, chapter 4 is where we begin. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest 
after the order of Melchizedek. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Remain seated while we sing this next hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, and just consider the love of God for you as you sing. Body of Christ broken. Body of Christ broken for us. Greg, the body of Christ broken for us. Blood of Christ poured out. Blood of Christ poured out. Twice a month, we have the opportunity to come to this table, and uh, it never grows old. It never becomes a chore or a difficulty. Sometimes we have crumbs around here, and that helps make it a little more real. I bet there were crumbs the night when Jesus was betrayed, when he broke the bread and handed it to his disciples and said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, all of you. And then he took the cup, the last cup of the meal. This is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it, all of you. And they did. Now, they didn't quite understand what they were signing up for. They were going to be accomplishing the work that Jesus came to call them to and had walked with them for those three, three and a half years to make them aware of somewhat of what it was like, what they were going to do. They had a message to share, and it was all about him. The gospel began with the story of Jesus, the truth of death and resurrection, the promise of a coming again. And those disciples anticipated so much and suffered quite a bit, most of them dying because of their identity with Christ, those initial disciples, apostles. We are His, and so we come to this table by invitation. He has redeemed us. The blood covers our sin. His life becomes the very life that we live as we trust in Him and walk with Him. I'm glad to be able to come today. How about you? Amen. And the other thing we do is recognize we're all brothers and sisters, and we didn't get to pick this family necessarily. God picks this family. And every gathering of believers where people are committed to Christ and to one another, it's God who puts us together. And sometimes being put together means we get a knot on our head or a little scrape where the iron hits iron or something as we grow up together spiritually and walk with Him. So when you come, you come receiving what grace is needed. The timing for delivery of that grace is always God's. That way you can be sure it's going to be right. So you come trusting in him, eating and drinking. You'll tear a piece out of the loaf, dip it in the fruit of the vine, and eat and drink at once. Kind of an old method of doing it. Let me pray, and then we'll pass this meal around. Father, I want to thank you for the bread that satisfies. Not the loaf that we break but the Christ who was broken for us, who took our place on that old cross. Some of us grew up singing that old rugged cross, emblem of suffering and shame. For Jesus, it was the place of suffering and death. Hanging there in the last part of his tenure in that place in the dark. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
And today we come to this table with the whole story and our understanding, all that Jesus did and why he did it and the fact that he's at the right hand of the Father and is coming back to receive us to himself. And we realize how blessed we are having been saved like that from our sin, having been brought out of the darkness into the light, having been translated from a kingdom that would destroy us ultimately into the kingdom of the dear Son. Thank you for this meal that satisfies our hungry heart, for the privilege of being a part of Christ, the Anointed One, His his family, His body. Bless your people as we eat and drink. Use us this week as we go out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Two rows right down the middle and tear a piece out of the loaf and uh, dip it in the fruit of the vine, and then we'll go to our seats and back around the sides. The meal is ready. Come, church. About this time in the service every week, we uh, have what we call the pastoral prayer. We all get in on this prayer. We agree together. And I'll voice it, but if there's someone on your heart whose name you want to mention to the Lord, you just kind of whisper it out to him. He doesn't get confused. He can hear all of our cries at the same time. That's how wonderful it is to have our Father and our God uh, to whom we go. So let us pray and uh, take some of these requests to the Lord, ask his blessing. Father, it's always good to come together and worship. It's always a blessing to stop for a moment in a service of worship and offer our needs to you. We pray for a lot of things. We pray a lot of petition-type prayers. But we do that because we need you, because you are not limited in your ability to meet a need. And we need you at work in our family as the body of Christ right here in individual families, individual lives, in our nation, for your church all across not only our nation but around the world. We pray that you will work through your people in every place, that you will protect your people where they are living in dangerous times when just a commitment to Christ, just a testimony of Jesus could lead to death. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are in those kinds of places. And we're thankful that you are guiding them and keeping them and blessing them and walking them through their journey and giving them a hope that is beyond this world as you have given us a hope beyond this world. And our prayer, Lord, is that you'll help us to live in this country where we are according to the Scriptures, according to the Word of God, led by the Holy Spirit, not by the minds of men who know not the Holy Spirit. But we pray, Lord, that we'll be able to pray for one another and continue to see you work in amazing ways. We ask for your mercy extended. We ask, O Lord, that you continue to be merciful to us so that we might walk with you in the places that you have placed in front of us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing your church across these United States and somehow reminding us every day and wakening us to the point that we have a responsibility to a righteous God. We've called you Father. You are the Father of those of us who know you, know Jesus. And we are thankful, Lord, that you are on the throne, that you're in charge. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that you will use us in our respective places, that the church will truly be the church biblically across this land, will be unafraid, committed, willing to sacrifice as we walk with you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We give you praise for all of that. The nations of the world, we lift up to you and pray that all across these nations you will continue to add people to your kingdom as they are born from above trusting in Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, for that work and give you praise for the realization that when you translate someone from darkness into light, it's, it's an amazing transition. 
to know nothing but darkness and to be given a light that opens up the truth of the gospel, that's an amazing gift. And we are so thankful for the working of the gospel in our land right now. We pray for these United States of America with all of our heart and pray, Lord, that you will continue to keep us and bless us and guide us so that we might be witnesses to the kingdom of God and the great working of Jesus Christ as Lord and King. Father, we pray for the leadership of our nation. We pray for President Trump. We pray for all of those who are a part of his cabinet. We pray for all of those who are involved in the decision process that affects us and affects our future and our present. And we pray that in the name of Jesus, you will be glorified in all that is done down the line, that your marvelous grace will be evidenced, seen. We thank you, Lord, for that. We pray for the lost. We pray today for people in our own families or connected to us as friends or people we've known through the years that we know are not yet born again. And we pray for people who live around us and work with us and all the people that sit down in the restaurant when we go there, all the people that pass us in the grocery store who do not know you. We don't know their names, but we pray that they might be saved. We pray, Lord, that those you have called to yourself, those that are being called even now, those who will come as the elect of God and trust in Jesus and walk with you. That's our prayer. We thank you, Father, for that. Pray today for those in our congregation and connected to it that need healing. Pray for Ron and Jody. I understand they're not doing very well today again. So we lift them up. We ask you, Lord, to touch them right now. We ask you to bring healing into their bodies and their lives in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father, that you'll work in the lives of all of our folk who are sick. We've uh, got a list of quite a few names on it, some names we know, most of them we don't really know them, but we're praying for them because they've been handed to us through people in this congregation. And so we thank you, Lord, for healing our sick, for your continued grace to us as we live. We thank you, Lord, that you wrap your arms around those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We continue to thank you for Teresa and for her family and the beautiful uh, realization of the present God, the memorial service, and in her life. And that's the beauty of it all. We pray, Lord, today as well for those who are afraid. As you live in the world today and listen, you discover people are fearful of a lot of things. And we pray for them that they might come to the peace that comes through Jesus that they might find themselves whole and complete in Him. Father, we pray for every pastor who has been given a responsibility for part of the congregation that is this part of the world, local pastors. And we pray, Lord, that You would anoint them, fill them with such an unction that they'll be able to do the job they're called to do, and they'll do it with joy, and they'll do it with completeness, and You'll be glorified in the preaching of the Word. Let us all today do our part in declaring this gospel Lord, may you just work in your people until all of them hunger to be fed, until all of us as pastors hunger to feed them as we stand in the pulpit week after week. We thank you, Lord, for your work in us, for the bread that satisfies the hungry soul, and for the hope that not a single thing in this world can take away that we have in Jesus Christ. Bless your people. Have your way in the continuing service of worship when we go out of here today, let us go out anointed and stirred and challenged to represent you and the people we meet. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody in agreement simply said, Amen. 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 We're going back to the book of Hebrews, obviously, and we're in chapter number four. And we're looking at three verses in that chapter. We'll have to think about verses in two or three other places. But the focus are on these three verses at the, uh, at the end of chapter 4. And I want to read them one more time. Since then, now let me just point out before I read this, that the previous verses, verses 11 down through 13, uh, there's a challenge to these people to enter into, to strive to enter into the rest that God's providing. 
The danger is that they might not enter in, obviously. So there is the challenge to strive, to make effort, to focus on entering the rest that God is providing for His people. We've been shown that that rest that is being provided has not been provided or given yet. Uh, that it's, it's certainly been expected and it's certainly a part of the story, but it's still time to get into this rest, this kingdom. And so the instruction up above is, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What is needed is belief and obedience to what is believed. And then in the latter part of that section of Scripture, it talks about the Word of God. And we talked about this last week, the Word of God, where it says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division or dividing soul from spirit, joints from marrow, discerning, and this gets pretty deep down in here now, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. In other words, this is what the word is like when it comes. It's going to open everything up. Everything that was hidden is in full view. God knows where you are and who you are. That's the point, that God knows that everything is open, inside, outside, every side, fully open before the word of God. Do you believe the Word of God has that kind of power yet today that when God speaks, He's able to make things that are pretty impressive, like creation? He did that, didn't He? And what I can figure out in Scripture is that the God who did that has not exactly changed any, that He is still that same God that we in Christ call Father. That's amazing. The Father that we love and bow before and worship and pray to is the God who made the universe. Or, if you want to put it this way, the universes. He is the one who made all things. Now, when I think about that and I'm coming into a place of prayer, it slows me down a little bit, which is what needs to happen when we pray. If we're going to have time in prayer, we have to kind of slow down and realize who we're praying to, into whose presence we've come, so that we can pray with a heart that's right, an attitude that's open, responsive to the living God. Now, you got all this warning in those preceding verses, and then you get such encouragement when you get to verse number 14. The writer comes in, the one who wrote this sermon, it's a sermon in style, you might call it a letter. But in the 14th verse, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. A confession that identifies who Jesus is, identifies the nature of this one who is the high priest because it's been revealed to us, even in this letter. The same confession he's been talking about all the way through these first few chapters, four chapters. We've got this great high priest. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Notice the double negative. We have not a high priest who is not able. I'm saying unable, but is not able to sympathize with our weaknesses. In other words, he is every time. But one who is in every, who in every aspect, respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, or boldly, as some translations say, let us boldly draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. The writer of this letter, the preacher of this sermon, has already given us a couple of preliminary pieces of Scripture to get us ready for this high priest focus. One, when we get into this 14th verse, we're going to continue from the 14th verse of, of chapter 4 all the way to the end of the 10th chapter before we finish 
with things related to the great high priest. We're going to learn a lot about the great high priest. We're going to deal with a lot of Scripture that points us back to the Old Testament pattern that was simply a reflection of the heavenly pattern. It was not the thing that Jesus is going to be the high priest in. That's the heavenly. So we're going to see some contrasts and some comparisons as we look at the high priest. Here are a couple of references given to us regarding the high priest prior to chapter 4, where it talks about him. Um, he came to help the offspring of Abraham, therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Now, that, he's not going to say much more about the high priest title at this point. He's going to move right on in chapter 3, just a few verses down from the end of chapter 2 where I just read. We see again, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Then when we get over to the end of chapter 4 in the 14th verse, we once again have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Only now we're going to deal with who that high priest is and how he functions. And it's all here in this next few chapters of Hebrews. The anticipation that came to the hearers of the preacher or the letter writer is, is of the first notes of what will eventually be a main theme, and that is the great high priest. The only thing difference, different between the name of the high priest in chapter 4 compared to the high priest in chapter 2 and 3 is that a word is added in that 14th verse, and that is the word great. The great high priest. It doesn't mention great in the other two accounts where the name is mentioned. But when you consider what he's done, how he's prepared himself, what he's accomplished, it is an amazing story of redemption, an amazing story of a high priest who will hold us, keep us, provide for us, get us home, who potentially, every time we gather for worship, will say, come, let's enter the presence of your Lord, my Father. Several years ago, I don't know, I, wasn't many, not a lot of you were here to hear a series of sermons on worship where every Sunday for several Sundays, I came and said, let us worship God. We're now being lifted up into the heavenlies with all those who worship around the throne. That's spiritual worship, attending to the Holy Spirit, attending to Jesus Christ. We were lifted up into the heavenlies. And we're looking at chapters 4 and 5 in Revelation. Most of that time is just kind of a reminder. Where we come to the throne room, and there is the Lamb. And there is the Father, but He's Spirit. So you're not getting an image. You're only getting an image of the Lamb. The one who came to this earth as a man, died as a Lamb. And the triunity of God was right there. The beauty of it, the worship of it, the angelic people, hosts that were there. All of that was amazing. I go there often because I need that fix. I need to somehow be reminded that this is not all of it here. I need to be reminded that though our worship sometimes finds a freedom and sometimes is something we, we rejoice in and cultivate, we only worship finally and truly when we are in the glorious presence of Him. The wonder of that, the beauty of it, always touches my life. But the Christological title of great high priest now is going to be left undeveloped from the 14th verse or from the beginning verses up until the 14th verse. But now is the time for it to be developed. So we're going to open it up um, a little bit today and then much more as we move on. There is this luxurious tapestry of theological cords that are all working together in the person of Jesus Christ, the great high priest. All these many things that connect. He's given a number of 
theological descriptions. He's called the Son of God. He is the divine Son of God. He carries that. He is the suffering founder of our salvation. Founder, pioneer, captain, all different words used in chapter 2 of our, of our uh, salvation. He's the imprint of God's very being or the exact imprint of His nature. He's the heavenly heir, the heir of all things. We got it right back in the beginning of chapter 1. He's the great high priest. And that great has just been added. We're ready now to take a look. These are not just discrete titles. Um, they are interlocking, overlapping realities or categories in the person of Jesus. He's all these things at one and the same time. Amazing is God's redemption as He sent His Son to save us. Jesus is the heavenly heir crowned with glory and honor, but He is at the same time the pioneer of faith who shares the full range of human suffering. And while he identifies fully with suffering humanity, he's even then the divine son, the reflection of God's own being, glory. All these descriptions of Jesus are true and active simultaneously. A patterned, beautiful fabric of a life and thus a hope for all of us. The two main words given to us today when we read 14, 15, and 16. Now jumping to 15 and 16. It's hold fast. Hold fast your confession, he said. Here's how it says it. I'll read it one more time for you. Let us hold fast our confession. That's the end of chapter 14. That confession is to be held on to. And we are to pray boldly. What it says talks about drawing. Why do you draw near? As human beings who've been redeemed walking around on the earth. What do we do when we come to the Father through the Son? We come, we, we do that when we want to pray, don't we? Isn't praying a big part of what the church does? Isn't prayer a big part of what our life is? Now here's what I've come to believe about prayer. A couple of small things. I've said this to me, I've actually said it from this pulpit way back at the beginning of my return back to this part of the world. I think when we're praying right in here, when there is someone voicing a prayer that encompasses the whole of heavenly connection and the fact that we're on earth representatively His, I'm, been, I'm convinced that our praying together is significantly important. And it's the prayer that I don't want to miss when I'm a worshiper. I want to be in on what the congregation is going to be agreeing on, what we're praying. Now, we may not always get it right. We may not always be praying for exactly the right things. But we're praying together because we recognize we will not continue to be the church He wants us to be if we do not continue to enter His presence, pour out our heart before Him, receive from Him what is needed in order to continue our journey as we step back to our place of serving and living. My individual prayers are important, but our prayers together, I think, count more. Every prayer is right when we're praying to Him for certain things. But let's elevate a little bit praying together of the body of Christ. Praying together and worship. Praying to the one who is being worshipped, acknowledging his worth and his value. I had a lot of good meditation, prayer time this week. Setting Scripture open, Holy Spirit working, struggling at points, but it was a great week for just time in the Word and time in prayer in the Word. Cultivating that. But I am convinced that my cultivating individual prayer is a part of a whole. And when we come together and the whole prayer is lifted up and opened up, that we're fruitful. That God is working using a praying church, a people seeking God, a people acknowledging God, 
along the way. Praying boldly. Look at verse 16 one more time. Chapter 4. Let us then with confidence or boldly draw near to the throne of what? Throne of what? Throne of grace. In coming to God in prayer, we have come to seek grace from Him. Something needed, something that He provides. Grace emanates from the throne. We might call it a judgment throne, but then it becomes a grace throne, doesn't it? Throne of grace. The preacher here who wrote this letter, speaks in chapter 1 of confidence, speaks in chapter 2 of hope. And I think he's speaking in the third verse, or the 16th verse of chapter 4. I think he's speaking more than anything else of our continuing coming to God in prayer and the receiving of grace and help in the time of need. I think this preacher wants them to be moved past fearful prayers or pitiful whinings, might say, or formal little ditties. Maybe he wants a way of praying that storms the gates, the gates of hell that stand, brings honest and heartfelt cries of human need. Maybe we haven't acknowledged our need as we cry out for His help. We have to consider all that as we pray because we're needy people in that. Second verse of what a friend we have in Jesus. Have we trials and temptations? There's a question for you. Is there trouble anywhere? Say, let's, let's make it personal. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Uh Uh-oh, I've got to stop here and slow down now. Since I've got trouble, why can't I be discouraged? Because you've got help. Because Jesus has accomplished everything necessary to put him in the place of the high priest through whom we will always be coming to God, always coming and receiving what we need to live. We will not be cut off from his help. The work of the great high priest. We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. That's not a bad hymn, you know. What a friend we have in Jesus. Because it is true, we, He knows our sorrows, and we know some of our sorrows. We feel them. We take care of our loved ones over a period of time, and we finally wake up at the end of it and realize, you know what? That was tiring. That was difficult. That was, that was hard. And then you miss your loved one after they're gone. And you feel that pain for a while. We, as a church, must continue to come to the one who knows our sorrow and is able to help us. Most of the time, we don't start with the bank. Most of the time, we don't start with the doctor. We start with the God who created us in order that we might establish our goings. And then we go trusting Him to guide us into what, as to what we need to do. Focusing on prayer a little bit. Let me give you a, um, a little statement. Richard Sibbs, quote. Now, Richard Sibbs lived um, 1577 to 1635. He'd been dead a long time. Did a lot of preaching, a lot of interior life understanding way back. Very good preacher, writer. A uh, 
He said this one time, encouraging confidence through our great high priest. He said, We may, with a heart sprinkled with the blood of Christ, now ascend into heaven, answer all objections, and triumph against all enemies. We may go boldly to God. I want you to hear this, because it doesn't sound like it's quite right, this last phrase. We may go boldly to God and demand the performance of His promises. Demand something from God? Well, you have to understand the language of the sibs and what he meant. It's explained, of course, what he meant was not grab it and run and demand, you've got to do this. That's an irreverent approach to the living God. But he said, have a Christ-centered faith that boldly trusts the word of promise and go to God and say, you promised. In legitimate times of need, when we're crying out to him, you promised. Now, does anybody besides me have a hard time doing that with God? That's because we don't know too much about this Father. We've been taught God is kind of hard. And then we were taught that God is just God and you can go in and, you know, you can offer prayers like ordering something at the fast food window or something. I need this, I need that. And, and you have to do it, Lord, because I'm not going to make it unless you do it. Confident prayer is what Sibs had because he knew what he had promised. And he knew this God well from the beginning of the book to the back. He knew the Word of God, which is important. Speaking that Word back to him. Here's a quote. I, got to, I had to give you this quote today because this is Martin Luther and this is his time, 500 years removed. Celebrating the Reformation, 500 years old. And Martin Luther was a big part of that. Luther had an assistant named Dietrich, and he wrote a letter to Melanchthon, who also worked with Luther, as you know. And in writing this letter, Dietrich said, I cannot admire enough Luther's steadfastness, his joy, his faith, and hope in these desolate days. He strengthens himself each day in his convictions by a constant application to the Word of God. Not a day passes that he reserves, but he reserves three hours at least for prayer out of the portion of the day which is most suitable for work. Uh-huh. One day I had the privilege of overhearing him pray. Great God, what a spirit, what a faith in his words. He prays with all the devotion of a man before God, but with all the confidence of a child speaking to his father. I know, said he, that thou art our good God and our Father. That's why I'm persuaded that thou wilt exterminate those who persecute your children. Now that sounds more like Luther. You'll take them out. <laughs> If you do not do it, the danger is to thee as much as to us, Luther's praying. This causes thine. What we have done, we could not have done otherwise. It is for thee, merciful Father, to protect us. When I heard him from a distance praying these words with a clear voice, my heart burned with joy within me because I was hearing him speak to God with altogether as much fervor as liberty. Above all, he supported himself so firmly upon the promises in the Psalms that he seemed fully assured that nothing he asked could fail to be accomplished. You might also notice what he's praying about. A hard time, and they were in ministry, he's praying about all that, God's protection, God's provision, God's taking care of them in their battles. And I think as we express our lives and practice and lay down some of the things that are pretty self-focused and start saying, Lord, I want to serve you, that you're going to find you can pray with a little more gusto about God's protection or God's dealing with the enemy or God 
making a way for us. I think we can do that in one. I think we can. Bold prayer ultimately is an expression of theological trust. It's the practice of prayer which rests in what we believe about God and what our relationship is in Him. It's the knowing of Him. Having this relationship with God and His Word that makes you know how far you can go in praying. We know and we speak our prayers of petition and intercession as we firmly hold to the revelation of the truth or the creed. Or the creed, what we believe. Build that prayer on the believing of that. So the preacher began this section at verse 14 by urging that the congregation hold fast their confession. You look over the Apostles' Creed every now and then, see if you still believe what it says. We haven't said it together very much for a long time. But we do need to refresh ourselves to see if we still believe what it says. The Apostles' teachings kind of put down in a very simple form. In the beginning, when this letter was being written, these people were told to hold to the conviction that Jesus is God's Son. He's the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. That's what you hold to. Who Jesus is, what He came to do. How does a confession of some theology, something we believe, about Jesus empower bold prayer. How does it make us bolder? First, I think it addresses the issue of the approachability of God. He doesn't hide from us. We might hide from Him. When you have sin working in your life and you're claiming Him and you're, maybe you've claimed Him for a long time, you're going to want to hide some until you're convicted about what it is you're doing. And it has to be a conviction that has to do with you and God. It's funny, I've been a pastor a long time, but what I've noticed way back, and it doesn't happen as much now because we're a little looser than we used to be. It's amazing how many people would hide from the preacher if they could see you in town. And they didn't always manage it. You know, sometimes I saw them. Or you'd go to the house and see them and they were making sure things were out of way. Because there were certain things I got nervous about. Now, I've been the kind of pastor when I go to somebody and say, I don't check the fridge. And I've never gone looking for things that were wrong. I'm, you know, you have to have some genuine concern for people. And a realization that God alone can change a heart and a mind. That that's not our task. That's God's task. Our task is to speak the truth and keep loving the people we're speaking it to. Seeing what God does. We've been schooled in what God is like quite a bit. And so uh, our nonchalance has to be kind of brought to attention again, I think. So that we... We quit coming to God as if it's just an order station where we put in our order. And, of course, we have every right to go to God and ask Him for help because He's the one that's going to help us. Jesus makes sure that access is there. He's the high priest who says, I know you, and He takes us right into the Father. And there's where we are. Another thing I like very well when it comes to praying is that our prayers sound awful feeble sometimes. You ever had this experience? I've had this a lot. You're praying this same prayer every week when you sit down with a prayer sheet and you prayed it again. And you start at the bottom this time. The name's in a different order, so that must be better. But you're, you're running through it and thinking about it and uh, all of that. And I said to you a long time ago, when we pray to the Father through the Son, our prayers become what they need to be when they get to the Son. He's the high priest. 
He's the one who carries our gifts in and offers them to the Father. He is the one that does all that. Remember the high priest from the old covenant structure? He went into the Holy of Holies. That's that inner sanction. One time a year. And thank God most of the time he came out. If it was a wrong offering or things were wrong, he might not. But in that holy place, the holy of holies, he could die. So the story goes that they used to bell him. Yeah, I grew up on a farm so you could bell a cow. You know where the cow was. If they're way back there a mile or two in the woods, get a good big bell where it could clang a little. Oh, cow walking along, clang, clang, clang. Where's the cow? Way down that way. Now, my dad had worse hearing than I did, and so when we'd work cattle, we'd be on horseback. We'd be racing out through the woods and hear the dogs barking who found the cattle already and are rounding them up. And we'd stop, and my dad would say, Which way is it? Well, I could have messed him up, couldn't I? I could have got us back home a lot quicker if I'd have told him it was back toward the house, but it would have been trouble. Because he couldn't hear and couldn't get a direction. He could hear a little bit of the other, but he couldn't get the direction. So I'd tell him what direction. We'd go, get the cows, get them in. Bell them. And so the man going in with the offering to God on behalf of his people had this bell on. Bell that would ring as he walked, as he moved. Came out. When we come to the Father through the Son, we bring everything we have. What we need, we take it right through Jesus. And when He says it, when He asks for it, I've tried to figure out sometimes. I know it's not there. What kind of saying did He say? What was His prayer like when He took my prayers and made them His? As the intercessor, the mediator, the high priest for me. I said, help! And he said, and he gave the Father my name and all the circumstance. He just, this is what he needs. He needs your love showing up. He needs your touch. He needs to feel your presence. Don't you like to feel his presence? Some of you know what that is. Most of us, I hope. But Jesus takes our prayers to the Father, and they are... I think you can just claim it. They're good prayers. <laughs> He's not going to mess it up. This is the Lord we're talking about. Listen to Thomas Watson. This is back in the Puritan days, way back around 1600. And here's what he writes. Prayer as it comes from the saints is but weak and languid. But when the arrow of a saint's prayer is put into the bow of Christ's intercession... It pierces the throne of grace. Don't you like that poetic pursuit? Languid, not much to it. But when it ends up in the bow of, the, of Jesus, wow, it goes right to the throne of grace. And we find help. We get grace and we find help in the time of need. Now, I, I, uh, I don't take a position on prayer that says you always have to have well-written prayers or you have to spontaneously be able to speak it or you should yell at God when you go to prayer. I'm, I'm never, I don't think that's right. In fact, I preached a sermon in, in this place one time, the only time I ever preached it. And I dug around a little bit and found it. Looked it over the other day just to, to get what I said. And it was a sermon from Jonah. And I used the second chapter. There's only three chapters in Jonah, the book of Jonah, the prophet. And in that second chapter, Jonah finds himself in the belly of a great fish, some kind, some kind of sea creature. We get all kinds of arguments say it's not a whale. That's okay with me. Just a big creature in the, in the water. Somebody's got a nice big opening in their throat. Don't you think? You want to be able to swallow this guy. 
I mean, he should be very thankful when he was going down the gullet that this big fish was more concerned about swallowing than chewing. Don't you think? So God knows who to get. And here he is, second chapter, sitting in that oversized guppy. With, not sure what to do. Not sure what to do. Maybe he's sitting on a kidney by now. I don't know. But he's in there. And he prays. Prays. Now here's the part that got my attention and the reason I, I'm, I'm just going to give you a brief little part of it is because in this prayer, every line almost of the prayer Jonah prayed was not his line. It was out of another psalm. And there's probably six or eight different psalms that have their lines used in Jonah's prayer. He's praying the prayers of the congregation. Did God hear? Oh, yeah, I heard him. And that fish, whatever he was, could not wait to toss him. Get out of here. That's an amazing story. And somebody said, that story cannot be true. Let me explain it. I don't, don't give me the, I don't want the scientific figure. Now, I know it's not possible if we think about it fully scientifically unless God has a special arrangement, which, by the way, might have. So I just believe it. I like that story. I like it a lot. And that helped me because at that time I was endeavoring to communicate here more and more the fact that we have a prayer book, that it's full of words and statements and ways to pray and language for prayer, and that if we use the Psalter and we went through the Psalms one by one, even if we just prayed a few lines of it, we could become a people praying the same way for certain kinds of answers to prayer. Most of it is worship. Most of it is thanksgiving when you use the Psalms. Most of it. We dare to raise our voice to the Holy God. All prayer as we raise our voice is prefaced by the issue of the glory of God versus human unworthiness. But we're coming through Christ. It's not a matter of worthiness. It's a matter of position in Christ Jesus. The great high priest makes the door, the way for us to go in. And he is the only one really worthy to pray these prayers to the Father. So he takes them and gets them to him. And that's what we need. Oh my God. Let me one other thing and I'm gonna I'm gonna quit. Time's up. Jesus suffered temptation like we do. How could he be tempted to sin? Well, he was uh, taking our place, he was preparing for us a way, and he was tempted. You know. As soon as he started, as soon as he's ready to get fasted 40 days and he's out in the wilderness, sent there by the Spirit, remember? Sent into the wilderness. And the first thing that happens to him is he's hungry. Finally, he realizes he's hungry, hasn't eaten for 40 days. And the enemy, old Slewfoot himself, shows up and says, Why don't you turn those stones into bread? That's who you are, you know, that's what you claim. Turn those stones into bread. And Jesus had an answer. It's not, this, this thing is not about bread alone. Not about just eating something. It's not about just getting bread. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God is what I live by. Every word. Lust of the flesh encountered, overcome. Desire of the flesh, encountered, overcome. Then he's on a pinnacle of a temple, 
and the enemy is telling him, why don't you jump down? And when you go, start down, the angels are going to come and let you down real softly. And you're going to be seen and recognized as who you are. It's going to be a wonderful coming out day for you. So you're not supposed to tempt the Lord your God either, are you? Trying to get him to do something that will show you off as who you are or who you claim to be. No. Not supposed to tempt the Lord yet. Pride of life. Gone. Got that one. The lusts that we deal with can be boxed up in some basic desires. Desire of the flesh, the pride of life, and the last one where he took him and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, you can get these early if you'll bow and worship me. We'll give them all to you. The lust or the desire of the eyes. And in those three, Jesus has overcome in every group of desires there are that can lead you astray. Now, he had, here's what we have to say about our Lord. He didn't have just a few days of temptation. He had three and a half years of it. Constantly badgered, constantly dealing with situations, constantly. And never one time sin without sin means he had no sin of any kind that affected him on the inside or the outside no sin without sin conqueror of the enemy and the high priest can come to us and say if you'll just come on all has been overcome even death has been conquered finally when the church begins its active ministry and he is gone He's not really gone. He's present in the person of the Holy Spirit. And every enemy is conquered. Satan has lost his power over him. And thus over us. But we hide in him. We stand in him. We live in him. And I'm thankful we do. How about you? That thing at the end in chapter 16 is really the way God's love works. Um, we ask for things. We're going to find grace. That's good. That's the gift of God. And we're going to find help in the time of need, which has that time kairos written into its word in Greek. Time is the right time or the chosen time. And guess who gets to pick when your answer to prayer shows up? God does. So when we go to him and we trust it with him and he gives us grace and he knows where we are and he's going to help us, guess what? you got an adventure ahead of you now. You know that he's heard you and that he will do what he promised. And here's the promise. Now you go back to living and you just start thanking him for his faithfulness, and you just live. One of these days you'll either find out it got fixed and you didn't know it, or all of a sudden it shows up enough for you to tell it, and he was faithful. People find this on their deathbeds even. People that we didn't talk about like, or talk to like this when they were dying, but we had a chance to be with them and watch Jesus work, and they just got, they just got home in a beautiful way. And they were fearful at the beginning but he brought them through and his timing was amazing and his sustenance and his care amen amen the great high priest let's pray father i want to thank you again today for the life that we have in jesus I want to thank you for loving us. I want to thank you that um, Jesus came to do your bidding, and he did it. He came to seek and save the lost, and he's doing it. 
And I'm so thankful, Lord, for the body of Christ, the church, the redeemed people of God who are learning more and more how great you are, how precious your love, how amazing your provision, that you are great high priest. Watch over us, care for us, and keep us. We'll thank you for it always. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer... Amen. Amen. We got time for fellowship today, right? And some coffee, spend a little time together. Don't rush off. We go down the boardwalk to the fellowship hall. And uh, if we, do we have anybody else visiting? I know we have Robert and Gloria here today from San Antonio. It's good to have them with us. Anybody else uh, visiting for the first time? We, yeah, I'm surprised to see you all come back. It's good to have you here. These are members of our church who live in Houston. No, just kidding. They come and see us often, and we appreciate it. It's been good. Glad you're here again today. May God bless you. All right, let me um, make sure my announcements are clear here. Pick up a prayer list as you go out. Our most important work is continuing to be on our knees. Um, so do that. That's all I have on there. It's going to be a good week. We're going, to, we're going to pray and work. It's going to be a good week, isn't it? Amen. Thank you. Receive the blessing of the triune God of grace. This is our Lord at work in your life and mine and us together. I get to pronounce it, but he's the one who does all this blessing. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all today, this week, and forevermore. Amen.